I think Greg Stein says I'm to call the meeting to order at 7.02. Uh, first, uh, first item on the agenda is to review and approve the minutes of October 14th, 2020. Do we have a motion? So moved. Any discussion? Roll call vote, Jessica, I, Keith. Yes. Maisie? Yes. Greg? Peter? Yes. The minutes are approved unanimously, 5-0. Um, um, Shelly, what do you have for us? So I emailed out the monthly financial report as well as the financial statements through December, December. I did that last time too, October 31st. I don't know why I'm trying to rush us. Um, 19 warrants were reviewed electronically, totaling $109,054.35. Thank you for signing those. Um, I don't have any concerns with the general fund to report at this time, but I am happy to take questions if you have any specific questions about the report. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep going with my update. Um, so one of the first things to talk about today is the school lunch account. This is uh, something that we've been discussing since last year um, when COVID-19 hit as being potentially problematic. Um, month to month, I've been giving you updates, letting you know I'm watching the account. Uh, currently, we have served about 400 breakfasts and 700 lunches at the school between September and October. Uh, however, the revenue is not covering our expenses. Um, we're looking at a revenue year-to-date snapshot of about 3,600 and our expenditures around 6,400. So our net income year-to-date is a negative $2,700. Um, the positive side is that Sunderland School Lunch Account started the year with just over 20,000. So currently with that negative year-to-date amount, we're looking to be just over 18,000 still in the school lunch revolving account. Um, revenues will continue to fluctuate. October is a good baseline for us because there's about 21, 22 school days, which is one of the most um, days of attendance in a month. Um, November and December are less, obviously, with the holidays and school closure. So it gives me a good point to sort of estimate out the rest of the year looking at the next couple of months. Um, we will not have enough funds to cover the 52,000 estimated wages. Um, Peter had emailed a question about the school lunch program in advance. Thank you for those questions, Peter. I appreciate having them ahead of time because then I can be a little bit more prepared for you. Um, now, while you would think that with less kids in school and with the delayed start, we might have some savings in the cafeteria staffing, um, and while we did have about a two week period where we weren't serving lunches from late August through the September 10th start date, um, our staff is currently working all of their regular hours and they are working harder than they ever have before um, because of the way that lunches are being served. They're having to package things individually in a lot of cases um, and deliver food to classrooms versus having kids go to the cafeteria. So. There are some instances where staff may be working week to week a little bit more than they normally would, um, which seems counterintuitive given the circumstances, but you know, there's these extra precautions that we put in place. Um, so I actually don't anticipate much changing with wages in the school lunch program, unless we have to switch to a fully remote schedule um, at any point, whether the state or the Board of Health um, forces us into that position. But at that point, we would be looking at reducing wages. So as long as we're maintaining a hybrid schedule, we'll st we're still serving lunch and breakfast. Um, so we do have some savings in the general fund. Uh, that's because of various staffing changes throughout the year. Or for example, the bus contract, as you know, came in cheaper. Um, but I, I'm concerned that we won't have enough of a savings in the general fund to cover all of our wages, which would mean we will have to look at other funding sources such as the school lunch, or not the school lunch, the school choice account. Um, I'm happy to take questions about that. It's just sort of a little summary. We'll keep watching month to month. I don't think right now we need to do anything. I, I'd like to give us a little bit more time with seeing how things pan out in the general fund to see if I can move more funds over. 
Um, but right now, this is really sort of just an update. And again, I'm happy to take more questions on that if you have them. Okay. Um, so just a couple of other quick things. Oh, go ahead, Keith. Um, just, just for, because I, I don't know, but are we, are we charging for any lunches at all? Or are we providing free lunches for everybody? Are the lunches we're providing only for families, uh, um, all under like the, the, the low income? No, so right now the USDA has approved free lunches for all children under the age of 18 years old. So they do not even have to be Sunderland students. However, Sunderland is not set up as a pickup location. So it is primarily Sunderland students because they're getting meals at school. Um, we are doing some delivery is my understanding and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but we are doing some delivery. And in those cases, we might be giving to siblings who are not necessarily um, in the school yet, but for the most part, they are students within the school and everyone is eligible for free breakfast and free lunch for this entire school year. Is that for the home delivery or in-person days as well? Everything. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's great in a lot of ways, right? Our community needs this right now, and it's it's fabulous in that regard. But on the other hand, you know, it's certainly the government reimbursement doesn't bring in what we would normally bring in in a regular school year. So it's definitely creating a hardship for us. Um, so just a couple of other quick things, and then I'll answer a few of Peter's other questions that were not in my report. Um, so a COVID expense update. So thankfully, the town of Sunderland has agreed to fully support our request for Municipal CARES Act funding for COVID-related expenditures. So for Sunderland Elementary School, that totals uh, over $100,000, about 101 and change. Um, 50,000 of that will be reimbursed because the school has already paid for those certain items, whether it's out of general fund or uh, school choice funds. So we'll receive reimbursement. And then we have another 50,000 roughly in new items that we're working on purchasing as I speak. It's primarily technology, those additional funds that we're looking to spend. Um, and then I can give you a breakdown. There's four categories in the Municipal CARES Act that relate to schools, cleaning, PPE, school distance learning, and social distancing. Um, majority of the 100,000 has gone to school distance learning, which is primarily technology related so that our teachers have the resources that they need and the students are able to access all of the technology needed to be, whether they're in a hybrid model or in person. Um, and then we have another 58,000, just as a reminder that Sunderland Elementary received directly from DESE for COVID grant relief. Um, most of that is spent down, but Ben and I are in conversation about how to use up the rest of those funds and they have to be COVID related expenditures unbudgeted. So, you know, we're looking at buying additional PPE, additional technology, um, you know, tables, walkie talkies, things like that, that can support the school environment given the current educational model. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, last two things, one is a FY21 update. So the house um, is working on their budget. It's not approved yet, but they did put out a preliminary budget. The cherry sheets are coming in with level funding, which is what the governor had most recently proposed also. So for the town of Sunderland, that would mean a loss of Chapter 70 revenue of around $5,000 related to Sunderland Elementary School. Um, we haven't heard from the town in any way, shape, or form about if that is going to have any direct impact on us, but I do want you to know that right now, if the budget is approved for level funding, it would be a $5,000 loss to the town for Chapter 70. Actually, and, yep. Actually, the, the town was assuming that we were going to be getting 20% less in chapter 70 money than uh, was in the governor's budget, uh, taking a very conservative position so that in fact, we're gonna end up, and they were also assuming we're gonna get less in the general government state aid. Um, and since the level funding position is now in, in the Senate bill as, as well as the house bill, seems like that's gonna go through, in which case the town they're certainly not coming back to us for more cuts based on the chapter 70 numbers. Uh, you know, you could argue that we should be approaching them for, 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 for more, uh, for more spending, but I don't think that's the direction to go in right at this time, but we're certainly, the town is certainly better off than the assumptions that were made during the budget process. Great. 
Um, so the final piece is FY22. So we are currently thinking about what next year's budget will look like, even though there's so many unknowns. Um, Sunderland is one of the few towns that have already requested and put out their timeline for budgeting purposes. Um, I think the original request was early January, but Darius has been in conversation with Jeff, the town administrator, about you know how realistic that goal is for us and whether or not we'll actually have something ready. But it is on our mind. My goal is to have something for us to start to talk about next month. Um, but you know, there's so many unknowns. We have no idea what the classrooms are going to look like next year, what staffing is going to look like. But you know, we'll make some attempts in the next month or so to start to take a look at that stuff. That's all I have. I'm happy to take other questions. Um, let me see. Did I answer everything Peter had talked about? Um, you had asked about. Uh, the special education revolving fund, Peter, on the enrollment spreadsheet that was shared, there were two students in grade three um, that were considered coming in from another district. I did check in with Ben and Karen Ferrandino, our special education director, and there is actually only one person coming in out of district, and the other one um, looks like it should have been placed in the school choice column and not in the tuition in so that was a typo on our end so there is no additional revenue other than what we already have planned there um, cafeteria we talked about uh, you had asked about the bus so we're currently paying that retainer fee in the bus contract across the board all five schools are pitching in for that retainer fee um, we are still planning to wait until January I did look at the busing numbers for Sunderland reminder Sunderland only has one bus um, we're getting close a couple of days a week. I think there are 20 and 21 students already on that bus. So if we are to increase the number of kids coming with additional planning, um, moving into new phases, it may have an impact on what we need for transportation. So um, I don't think we're ready yet to drop that retainer fee, but the goal is still January so that we can see some additional savings through the rest of the school year. Um, and then the last comment or question you had was sort of looking into school choice numbers. Um, and I have reached out to Karen again about the special education school choice students. Uh, she's going to take a look at that in more detail and I can provide a better update next month of what the um, increment claims might look like for this year. You know, originally Ben and I had looked at school choice and the numbers looked similar to the prior year. But honestly, we haven't, I haven't looked in greater detail. I'm not sure if Ben has. So that's another conversation that we can have before the next meeting to see if that's changed at all, given what the final decision on the educational model and see if any families have just made changes in their plans since we started school and now. So Ben and I can definitely get back next month with some more concrete information for you. Thank you. Because that's, that that's an area where in order to make this year's budget work, you took advantage of the larger than expected sped increment to pay for um, basically salary increases out of that because we were level funding our budget. And that sort of sets you at a higher starting point for the following year in terms of what you're taking out of school choice. And so, you know, if that number wasn't going to come up to as good a number as it did this past year, then that would be something that we would both ought to know about and be concerned about. And you know, the main thing is just keep an eye on it. Absolutely agree 100%. So we'll we'll come back with some more information for the December meeting for Great. you. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't have anything else unless you guys have questions for me. Um, can you hear me now? Outstanding. All right. Uh, in that case, thank you, Jessica, for, for taking off the meeting. Um, Time to move on to public comment. We do have a written submission, but I didn't know if uh, anyone who's currently online would like to go first. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 Kim, set up Boom, Boom, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Kim Saldit Poulin, and I've been a special education teacher here at Sunderland for the past 10 years. And I want to thank you for allowing me to be here and for giving me the opportunity to speak. I appreciate all of your service 
and all you're doing to keep our Sunderland school community safe during these unprecedented times. I wanted to let you know that SES staff continues to work tirelessly to provide a meaningful education to all of our students. While 43% of our parents opted at the beginning of the year to have their children learn strictly from home, we at the school continue to provide dynamic learning opportunities to all of our students, whether they are in our building two or four days for our more vulnerable learners, or have chosen to learn at home. As you can imagine, teaching under COVID has been the most challenging time in our careers, as it continually requires us not only to create new pedagogy, but to try and balance the very real risks to our health and the health of our loved ones that we take from simply going to work. The fact is the pandemic is getting worse nationally and locally. As you all know, we had our first case of COVID in the building last week, and the experience was unnerving. Districts all around us who have faced similar challenges have shifted back to completely remote learning environments. But on Monday, the dedicated SES staff who had agreed to provide hybrid in-person learning walked back through those doors. We did so because we are committed to our students and their families. And we did so with trepidation and frankly, fear. We remain concerned, especially when we hear discussions continuing as case numbers rise all around us, that the school is considering bringing even more students back into the building. As the winter fast approaches and opportunities being outdoors are diminished. Public health experts everywhere agree that these are the conditions that can lead to severe outbreaks. We are not naive about the pressures the district faces from parents anxious to get their kids back into the classroom. We would like nothing more than that for that to happen too. Many, if not most of us, have kids in school and share that sense of urgency. But as fatigued as we all are of it, like the nation, Sunderland Elementary remains in the midst of a very real and expanding public health emergency. And it is our hope that when you use the term abundance of caution, it is with the understanding that lives are at stake. Our lives, the lives of our family and loved ones, the lives of our students and their families. Let's be very clear about what an abundance of caution really means and not use that term lightly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else currently online who would like to speak? Yes, I would oh. like to share. Go ahead, please. My name is Victoria Palmer, and I'm the school psychologist, school counselor, and head teacher at Sunderland School. I've been there for 17 years, and I want to thank each of you for your support tonight and your service to our communities during these upended times, as well as the opportunity for me to speak. I'm really grateful for your leadership and I rely on you to make informed decisions to keep everyone safe. Tonight, I speak as a faculty member, proud of my hardworking, clever, dedicated colleagues who are working overtime to meet the needs of our wonderful students. We eagerly look forward to times when we don't have to wear masks, when we can resume carefree time on playground equipment, experience joyous community school events without the constriction of COVID guidelines and immerse ourselves in the broader experiences of school. For now, we are often telling our in-person hybrid students to please pull their masks up over their nose, manage the six foot distance rule, share absolutely no materials such as pencils, crayons, and we deny students access to universal playground equipment. It's all rather surreal and we hope, of course, it's temporary. 
Our faculty have responded dutifully to safety protocols, but now are increasingly concerned as we watch the facts on local and national news. The virus is getting worse, uncontrollable. Let's face it, we're all blessed to live and work in farmy, fresh and fun country, but we are not immune to this deadly virus. Why then is Sunderland Elementary planning to expand the number of students in the building at a time when we are facing this deadly disease? That doesn't sound like we are using an abundance of caution. What makes us think we can avoid the inevitable risks of having more students and thus more exposure to keep us safe? The decision to return students into the building is frightening and contrary to public health recommendations to safely socially distance. Teachers feel anxious, worried, and overwhelmed. National news is foreboding, and we are putting ourselves, our family members, and the students and families at risk with this district prerogative. I sincerely ask you tonight to thoughtfully consider an immediate move toward temporary remote learning for all grades to ensure safety. The Thanksgiving holiday is upon us with uncertainty surrounding more indoor large gatherings and the very real public health risks associated with an inevitable spread. While not speaking here tonight, I assure you many of my colleagues share the same reservations. I encourage you to establish safe and fair metrics, a clear established policy that includes careful decision-making with authentic public health data coupled with scientific expertise. We are playing with fire and your actions in consideration of this are requested in order to maintain the health and safety of our entire community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to make a public comment? Okay. Um, I do have one submitted in writing uh, from Allison Booth Mayo. Dear Sunderland School Committee, I am a Sunderland resident and a parent of an SES student writing to urge the committee to open SES on a full-time in-person basis. The COVID-19 crisis and the governmental and societal response to it have resulted in a number of other public health crises, uh, one of which is the lack of full-time in-person schooling. Being in a school is critical to the well-being of our children from mental, emotional, social, and educational standpoints. Uh, particularly troubling is the fact that the lack of consistent in-person learning has disproportionately negative impact on children from families of limited means, parentheses, whose caregivers may be put in a position of deciding between earning a living and caring for and supporting their child during remote learning, and parentheses. And those that do not have a stable, secure, and supportive home environment. It is time to give our children full access to education by allowing them to attend in person full time. While COVID numbers have been increasing across the state and locally, Sunderland is currently in the gray category and there have been no known cases at SES to my knowledge. I would urge the committee to follow the state's directives to schools uh, should be fully open under the circumstances. On a personal note, my son has been very happy to be in school on his hybrid days. Not once has he complained about having to wear a mask or that in-person school is now so different in many respects. Greg, I think your sound blew again. It's been the last 10 seconds or so. There's a buzzing coming. Okay. 
Well, the buzzing stopped. I hear it coming back now. <laughs> Should I take over, Greg? Okay. All right, back to the agenda. Unfinished business, anti-racism and equity committee update. And Amanda is here. Take it away, Amanda, or uh, Darius, or whoever. <laughs> question, question, Jessica. Should we finish reading? I think the letter was, had he finished reading the letter? I think there might have been a sentence left. Would you like me to read it into the record? Let's see here. Um... All right, on a personal note, my son has been very happy to be in school on his hybrid days. Not once has he complained about having to wear a mask or that in-person school is now so different in many respects. He's just glad to have some limited sense of normalcy by being able to go to school. Thank you all for your service on the committee during this especially difficult time. Sincerely, Allison Booth Mayo. So thank you, Allison, for your input. Still buzzing? No, that's better. Oh, good. All right. Well, I'll just hold this thing up to my head and wife will be there. Thank you. Oh, uh, yes. And yes. And uh, again, we'll have uh, an anti racism and equity committee update from uh, Allison. Uh, please take it away. Or Amanda, hey, I'm trying to read this type. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all again. Um, I'm a lot has happened. Um, I'm looking at my notes, and I have a lot to a lot to tell you about. Um, so there is an all committee meeting coming up district wide anti racism and equity committee meeting coming up on Thursday on the 19th. Um, and it's going to be in the afternoon. So that's something that's coming down the pipeline. Um, rewinding back to just under a month ago, um, and Mr. Modesto can say more about this, but there was um, a screening of, a community screening of I'm Not Racist, Am I? And it was open to the community I was, I was um, watching on YouTube. There was also a stream on Facebook. And um, it was on YouTube. Um, there were a group of students, seventh graders in the comments who were at first kind of just spamming the, um, the chat and I, I was watching on YouTube, so I immediately muted the chat. Um, I was I was a little surprised that the chat was even open because <laughs> there were going to be a lot of students and given the opportunity to cause some chaos, <laughs> it's often tempting <laughs> for young people with uh, <laughs> not fully developed frontal lobes to um, be a little be a little impulsive and chaotic so i muted the chat and it wasn't until the following day um that i heard that the the spamming of the chat devolved into some incredibly racist comments um they the students kind of renamed themselves in the chat to they switched their names to teachers names and then um started saying like who let the slaves out and things like that. Um, so the students were identified and um, Mr. Dredge followed up with them and their families. And the following day, the entire school had follow-up discussions planned. So the seventh grade classes um, really discussed how their classmates' behaviors affected them. Um, and it sounds like those discussions were really positive um, and productive. And this, the offending students had to be a part of those <clears throat> discussions so they heard how their actions impacted their classmates. Um, I provided an affinity space 
for students of color during that time is just an opt-in if students didn't want to participate in their class discussions with their predominantly white classmates about things like why the n-word is so problematic or about the events of the screening the night before um, so a couple of students took advantage of that um, which is great and then um, an apology was made to the organizers and uh, other participating schools at the follow-up meeting. And there was also a survey at Frontier that was issued to the students and 470 students responded. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly read off some of the results of that survey. Um, and let's see, for ending the N-word and that kind of campaign, 69 per students gave it a thumbs up, uh, 13 said in the middle or not sure, and 18% said thumbs down. Um, the logo redesign, which is another initiative, was 63% thumbs up, 30 in the middle, not sure, and 7% thumbs down. Documentary reaction, 60% thumbs up, 32% in the middle, not sure, 8% thumbs down. And the most common question uh, to the survey was, when are we doing this again? Or will we have more conversations like this? So overall, it's pretty positive. Um, and as frustrating, really infuriating, um, as the actions of those kids were, no one can say that this isn't an issue in this community, they kind of made the case for us, which is, that is the silver lining that I have found um, from this. Um, in addition to that, some more on the kind of elementary and across district side of things, on November 3rd, on election day, we had a full professional develop development day. Um, in the morning, Frontier had Radical Empathy Consulting from UMass. Um, and the elementary schools, I was the uh, keynote speaker kind of kicking off that professional development day. And then they continued to do their uh, pathway work with either the history of racism in America or uh, identity and white privilege. Um, and then in the afternoon, it was the entire district together with various professional development choices, including sessions with Dr. Elizabeth Pryor, um, who does work around the N-word and the use of the N-word, um, both in historical contexts and contemporary contexts. And I led a professional development session about um, how to address community pushback to uh, anti-racist curriculum changes and teachings and how to really get community buy-in um, and then address kind of various concerns that parents might have or community members might have. Um, let's see. Um, 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 wow, we've done so much. Uh, um, the elementary schools are almost done with their professional development pathways. So there are eight sessions and tomorrow will be the final wrap up for all of that. Uh, Frontier has five more sessions with the Radical Empathy Consulting Group. Um, or radical empathy consulting, I should say. Um, the peer leadership group at Frontier um, held their second meeting. And I'm really honored and happy to be a part of that. And their kind of mission this year is to really think about how to involve more students in these conversations because, like, the surveys really indicated students want and really kind of crave these conversations. Um, and so the peer leadership group is really thinking about how they can kind of structure that. Um, 
The logo design submission deadline is the 16th, so yesterday. <laughs> um, School-wide voting is going to take place uh, in early December, so in a couple of weeks. Um, the PSA will be coming out with student voices and educational clips about why the logo is being changed. Um, and let's see, some just kind of grade-wide um, updates. The eighth grade just started a joint English language arts social studies unit on the junior edition of Stamped, which is really exciting. And I have been working with Mr. Dodonna's 10th grade English class. They're reading Fences. Um, so I've been meeting with his classes and talking to them about a lot of things, um, but particularly the um, usage of the N-word and continuing the conversation that was started a couple of weeks ago, um, because as they're reading the play Fences, the word is featured really heavily, predominantly by Black African American characters referring to each other as such, but occasionally there is a white character who will refer to um, other individuals with the slur. And so students kind of wanted more understanding of, okay, what do I do in this context of I'm in class and I'm reading out loud, what, what do I do when I say it? Um, do I panic, which is what every student before has done. And so we've, ha we've had um, with his two classes kind of conversations around class norms and just the history of the word um, and just giving students more context about this word that has such a weight in their lives. And um, yeah, I, I would say that those conversations went really well. Um, and then on the 12th, so this past Thursday, um, the, um, there was a meeting with an update on moving forward with the Advancing Anti-Racism in Schools Assessment. Um, so that was a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so I, I guess I'll take questions now. <laughs> or Mr. Modesto, if you have anything to add that I might have I missed. I just wanted to, to chime in that, you know, um, the professional development day was so well received by the teachers um, and I was able to attend Amanda's um, presentation, which was excellent. Um, I think across the board we heard, I think we heard a lot of, um, our first phase is starting to get comfortable talking about talking about mm -hmm. race, talking about um, racism, and and I think it, it's we're seeing that with the teachers in the sense there's more comfort in addressing and opening up to um, the topic and having a, you know um, for some more understanding and for others some level of comfort that allows us to you know continue to work. This is you know step one of you know many years of work you know um, and that's a I just wanted to again thank Amanda because of your leadership there, and that day was, a, I think, was an excellent day. Um, I also sat in on the, the UMass presentation um, as well, and they did a, they did a great job with the secondary teachers as well. So it, um, I think we're we're at where we want to be in the sense of we're making progress and we're and we're, we're getting the work done. It's a lot of work too, and especially I think as Amanda said um, as well in a time where the you know, the teachers are overwhelmed as as it is, and we're putting this additional heavy PD material on top of it but i think it's um it's been very good so thank you amanda i do have um a question that i think you can give more clarity than i can on um what this is looking like not for teachers but for admin um, yes i have that i have that i was waiting you finish up and i have my little oh, okay oh so i just gotcha <laughs> no problem. and i know you said you attended the umass one and mine but which was better no i'm just kidding <laughs> yours was i thought yours um no, it was interesting yours, yours was very good but i want to comment because she was talking about hers was very much about like how do you 
if you know there's other uh, there's there's opinions and stereotypes of the work we're doing um and you you did a very nice job i thought it was even more so where it, i think it gave teachers comfort in addressing the material because a lot of people are concerned about what if someone says this to me mm -hmm. what if someone you gave real life examples that i thought were were fantastic so um, thanks <laughs> my ego just expanded yeah. a yeah. little yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're bigger than the square in your screen. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so on top of that, I have just I'm going to go through. Um, I created a quick in school community members. I I sent out this presentation to all of you so you can look at it. Um, we we spent a quite quite a bit of time on this already, so I'm going to. Um, yikes! No, it's the end. I gave it all away. Um. I'll just kind of go quickly through it um, and not read slides to you because you can do that. But you know, here's our district anti-racism and equity mission statement. Our basic our district goals, and these are the subcommittees of our um, of our anti-racism um, larger committees, broken up into these subcommittees, which all administrators are are assigned to a committee. Um, and these are our district's professional development goals, and a lot of what um, Amanda just talked about in in the different PD that we're doing. I am going quickly, but I'm going to get to the, um, the what exactly the, and spend a little more time exactly what the administration is doing. Um, the, we have our uh, administrative press and development, kind of our own mission statement here. <clears throat> and then we have our guiding questions for the administrative team. Um, and, you know, what does it need to be, in, is it, <clears throat> what do we need to be to effective anti racist leaders? How can we best coach our staff, students, and families in creating an anti racist school? How do we effectively support the anti-racist subcommittee's work in our policies, curriculum, and instructions, curriculum, instruction, and professional development? And how do we communicate and expand this work to our larger community members? So this is basically the overview for this year. Um, you know, we started, you know, with creating the, the committees um, in the summer and, and bringing a man down board. Um, in October 6, we talked to we met with Dr. Elizabeth Pryor, who Amanda talked about. But we talk, we were able to just meet with her as administrators to talk about how do we support classroom teachers, and then we also kind of picked their brain about um, coming from a leadership perspective and and trying to get ideas on how you know how we can be supportive and um, how do we make substantial how do we make change that can that will carry um, carry the momentum through multiple years um, of this work. On October 26th, um, all the administrative team did the REI um, virtual groundwater. And this organization is basically, you know, talking about how racial inequity looks across all systems, not just schools, and really for leaders to get an understanding about how um, the systems in the United States um, basically created, has created a groundwater problem. That's not one, um, it's not just the school's problem. It's not just the, um, the, um, or you know, judicial system, or, or police, or you know, it's across all, all across all, all, all areas, and then the social economic differences um, inside of racial equality, inequality as well. This was a was really good. It was full of heavy stats and figures, and really kind of pointed things out. Um, it said it was based for leaders, and I was hoping to get a little bit more about how to lead change from it. Um, and so, um, I'm on the lookout now for um, something to do this spring that. Um, focuses more on leader, and that was kind of leadership, and that's one of the. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute when I get to that slide. Um, I'm going to give an overview of what happened on November 3rd, and the ministers were, um, were involved with that. We are currently doing a um, book reading discussion on um, between the world and me, um, and we're actually starting that tomorrow, and and we have two administrative meetings next one um, in December. Um, we also are look, listening to the podcast uh, "Nice White Parents," which really. Um, does a nice job if you are a podcast listen to person. Um, it's a great podcast about how it's not just a based on intentions um, and really looking at the racism um, which occurred in New York City um, in the schools there and how they how they brought about change. And so really great podcast if you're a podcast listener. Um, it's one of those things where it's not due to January, but I think the whole administrative team has already listened to it because we had such momentum on that. Um, on January 22nd, it's going to continuation of the, the work that was done um, in, uh, on November 3rd, and Amanda and um, other presenters are there. We have a second book that we're going to read. Um, we have two books because the administrative team was fighting over which books they wanted to do, and so we said, let's just do them both. 
um, and um, past the origins of our discontent. Um, and we're looking for a, 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 a facilitator to go through that book and kind of push us deeper into um, you know, the, the, the main means in, inside the book there. Um, right now, the, the April, May is where I have a TBD because that's really where the I, REI, I think we're gonna shift directions and try to find something else for about school leadership um, and supporting school leaders and through change. And so I'm looking for um, to fill those, those two um, things there. And then in May, we start our planning period as well for the second year of PD. And we'll be meeting with our um, anti-racism and equity leadership to talk about, you know, what does year two look like? What are we going to bring in? Um, how are we going to develop that? And then and develop any summer PD as well. So that's kind of where we, and this is the um, Rackle Empathy Consulting Group at UMass, the topics that they're doing on each of the, um, the five dates coming up. All right, let me get myself out of here. So, any questions there? Hmm. I just wanted to say, um, I had uh, a couple of daughters watching the, the YouTube video, and uh, one of them reported to me you know, the, that things went on, uh, but I think, I'm gonna push back on her, I think she was under the impression that nothing ever came of it. And it, and it sounds like you guys actually did a, a really good job of addressing it. So I want to maybe follow up and, and try to understand like uh, how it was perceived by, by other kids. And, uh, but, but thank you for that uh, uh, explaining to us what happened and how you followed up. Um, any other discussion? Oh, thanks. This seems really great. And now I want to go do the whole administrative curriculum. Too. <laughs> All right. Yeah, outstanding. Thank you, Amanda and Darius. And uh, I guess we're on to the snow days and remote days update. That was just me taking the unfinished business of last month where I said, thank you, Amanda. I think we got a few Bye, everybody. Thank you for all you're doing. Um, it was on the agenda last week where we had a just in the last month where we had a discussion. I was just laying, you know, kind of closing the loop that I did send an email out to those who are watching and don't are, don't get our my emails um, that we are going to do remote days during snow days unless there's a massive amount of snow that causes outages or just plain shutdown. Um, what that amount looks like, um, I didn't want to put it in kind of numbers and have people, you know, saying this, you know, agency says it's going to be six inches. This agency says twelve inches. So. It's kind of one of those things where the superintendent will know it when he sees it and or she sees it and um, I'll make the call at that particular time. So, um, so there's still maybe snow days when I'm saying where we have me at the close for if there's too much going on. So that was that. Hey, Greg. Outstanding. Any comment discussion? Outstanding. All right. Uh, on to policy ACAB anti-discrimination anti-harassment policy and uh, grievance procedure. And I believe we're up for a vote. Yep, the only, change, the only change was made with the names were removed. That was a recommendation put forward by the school committee to remove the names of the, the members who we were reporting to and then create a spot on the website where people can find that information. So that was the recommendation. So we did remove those and once this is approved, we'll put it on the website, um, you know, what administrators are in charge of what, so that when that changes, you don't have to revote the policy. Outstanding. We get a, a motion to approve. I move we approve policy ACAB. Outstanding. Second? I'll second. Good. Okay. All right. Roll call. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right, uh, and now on to policy BEDH public comment at school committee meetings. This, I don't know, this feels like it's working out okay for an hour until we get through this COVID business. With the understanding and, that we're being flexible with that 3 p.m. deadline, I actually, or was it earlier, it was last week, I wanted, I made a public comment to Frontier, but I didn't get my act together for 3 p.m. to submit it. 
And I was grateful that they they made an exception. So I hope that that will be our shared understanding for our committee that we'll make exceptions as we're able. I think so. Sounds any words? Any were exceptions made tonight? Yeah. All right, uh, I'll, I'll make a motion in favor of passing it. Any a second? Second. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, or sorry, let's start with Maisie. Yes. Uh, Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Jessica? Yes. And Greg, yes. All right, unanimous. All right, and on to new business. Community, community. Uh, health indicators, changes, and updates. Um, this is a big deal. Obviously, we've had comments uh, concerned with are we keeping the school, uh, up, you know, should we be moving to full in person all day, every day? Should we be moving to remote? Um, Jessica, I believe you, you added this to the uh, agenda. Uh, I added the next item to the agenda. You added the next one? I think okay. this one is about the metrics well, for vision. Is, Probably is this, uh, uh, Meg, on this one. Is this a uh, Darius, uh, Meg? Yep, I was just letting you, um, there is, you know, the two kind of do fall into one another because we start talking yeah. about metrics and then we start talking about, you know, what is the reasons for closures and when do, when do we close and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we created a new, uh, an updated metric, um, basically coming out of what happened in Sunderland where we had a secondary indicator being um, that Sunderland was red um, and the Board of Health made a decision um, not to close schools. And so we wanted to update the language around that. I did send it out, another one of those documents I did send out to all of you. Um, and I can present it here just what the changes were. Um, but I think, I know that this is gonna roll into B. And so once we roll in, roll into the other you know, question about what's going on now, um, so it is slightly, um, slightly different. Slightly different, but let me present let me present those to you. Um, nope, wrong one. All right. I don't think you can't start on slide ten. Um, so let me just kind of run through it. Basically, just, I like we continue. This is you know coming from our from Meg Birch. She just wants to constantly remind everybody, you know, physical distance, mask, 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 and stay home when you're sick. And I still haven't fixed the typo there that says mange instead of manage illness. Um, uh, the key, so what we did, I did is I highlighted anything in yellow, which is a change, kind of like how we do with um, our um, policy. So our, our key, our data sources are still the same or um, moving forward. Um, basically what happened here is that the, I put this, uh, I would say I, Meg, put this together, um, and I put this together, sent it out to the boards of health for them to review. They would agree to um, them. And then that Friday, um, the uh, governor came out and, and re reduced these new, um, the new color coding. Um, the last color coding was, was certainly didn't work for our community. Um, and I, I know Jessica came to the um, Frontier Committee meeting um, to explain that um, the belief that even this one still does not meet our um, our smaller population towns. Um, so we start getting under 5,000, then what do those numbers kind of look like? But um, this is basically what the state has put out. Um, and that basically in the guidance of the state is saying that, you know, you shouldn't be closing schools unless you've been three weeks in the red um, or have um, identified in-school transmission. So, um, I've said from the beginning that I doubt that our, um, our our boards of health is going to be waiting until we have three weeks in the red um, in levels of in-school transmission and that they're going to be looking at the cases in our community to make decisions. Um, um, again, so what we added here is that that um, when these thresholds are met, we would have a consult with the local board of health. And I've been in conversations with our local boards of health um, at least three of them, um, and all kind of almost every day this last five or six days. So um, this was the incident rate instead of daily rate, um, which is the, the correct word usage there um, following what was put out by the state. Um, and this is the one where we changed the secondary indicators to um, 
would meet would result in immediate consult with the local board of health, not just straight closure for 14 days. That we should be looking at um, where the data is coming from, and so forth. Um, Can I make a quick comment on that? Sure. Just as, while it's right in front of us, so I, I track daily numbers for Franklin County um, for the district where I teach and our metrics. Um, right now, Franklin last 14 days, Franklin County's had 68 cases, so we've already passed this one. Um, our um, tertiary numbers indicators that have changed. Um, and then the last two slides are um, talk about um, what does it take to get a rapid mobile testing unit. We just wanted to get that information out there to the into the hands of um, both you and the public. Um, and um, that's what these these slides kind of go through to talk about the rapid mobile testing unit overview. Um, and what does it take to get that if you have uh, uh, two more individuals in a single classroom with a test positive? There's kind of, they wanna show if, they, if you have transmission in the school, you can always apply for it if you don't meet these numbers and you have cases um, and they may or may not. Um, yeah, another <laughs> testing rule, so. So that's that's the general overview of that. Um, since that has gone, gone out, we've had a uptick in cases in our, um, community and it's kind of resulted in almost daily conversations with the Board of Health, um, depending on which community um, cases that may be affected to the school. So it kind of rolls into, those metrics kind of roll into, you know, the next topic on the conversation is there's been an uptick in our community. Um, we did have to have a, a second grade class go remote um, because of, of, you know, the, the possibility of exposure. Um, and so um, that's kind of where we're at. As I said, we're transitioning into the this topic that was put on the agenda. So um, hot off the press, this is probably a nice question. The Board of Health met, um, the Joint Board of Health of the four towns met uh, at 6, a, 6 o'clock this evening in between my two school committee meetings. I jumped off and went over there. Um, and they are, uh, um, have made a decision to close to go remote the week following Thanksgiving and have the chairs look at the numbers um, at the se second half of that week following Thanksgiving to see if there's a continued uptick in the community um, and see where those numbers are at. So those are, they just met the again at, at six o'clock tonight. So this is kind of hot off the press. I'm gonna have to do a, a communication to families tomorrow about what that will look like. Um, but again, looking at the week after um, Thanksgiving, the concern being that, um, you know, with all the family contacts and stuff, will we get an up, even greater uptick in the community? The last couple of days um, overall in the county have gone down, um, but um, you know, it's uh, I, I don't know where I don't know where it's heading right now. I'm as concerned. You know, I had a conversation with Jessica earlier today. I am concerned as well. Um, you know, overall, this is the height the height of where we've been at for our community. That's for sure. We can't hear you, Greg. Thank you, Darius. It feels like we're moving straight into to topic B, um, the uh, in-person learning status. Um, and again, the two, it, it feels more or less like one topic. Uh, we have any other comments right now? I would like to say um, that I know that we're getting some direction from the state. Um, I'm glad that we're, it sounds like we're on the same page that we should not follow that blindly. And that uh, you know, locally we, we have uh, a responsibility to do what makes sense for our community. Uh, understanding that uh, Beacon Hill is, is always trying to work out a compromise that makes sense inside of 495 and uh, rural Western Mass. Um, Let's put it this way, if, if the governor really wanted to dictate what we were going to do, uh, it, it would have been edict and, and not left some of the stuff uh, in the hands of the, the local boards of health and the local school communities. Um, I want to understand, because I've heard some people push back, well, uh, this, we're contemplating moves that are potentially contrary 
to uh, the advice of coming out of Boston, um, but I don't understand what consequences might be associated with that. Um, Darius, I don't know if you can comment there. Well, I, it's one of those things where, again, the, 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 you know, the early, you know, in, the, in October when the, the commissioner was talking about those districts who did not go to create an in-learning, um, in-person learning model, um, that they were going to start auditing those districts to make sure that your remote model was re was robust enough and that you're meeting all the, the different check boxes. Um, I looked at it as I couldn't believe it when he said it because it was very much like, I mean, doesn't it go back to like some presidents that you'd get audited by the IRS if you went against them kind of deal. Um, yeah. So it, 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 that's kind of how it felt. I couldn't, you know, um, you know, but I understand their push in communities that were remote that didn't have the numbers at the time. I was kind of torn myself on that where it, there was such low numbers in those communities, you know, but they did leave it up to the community and then they were changing their minds. I think they're trying to do both. You know what I mean? They're trying to keep it local control and then they're trying to manipulate local control. Right now we do have, you know, there's a lot of districts around us that have um, stopped their either, um, some of their vulnerable learners. Um, I think we're the most, one of the more open districts um, in Franklin County. Um, and so some of the other ones have chosen to go remote due to the uptick in numbers. Um, and yeah, so what happens with the state? You know, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to make policy decision here based on threats from the state. You know what I mean? I think the um, you know they're saying that schools are safer than you know transmissions happening outside of schools, not happening inside of schools, and the data sh and the data show is showing that. So, um, but it doesn't make I'll be honest, it doesn't make my job any easier. I've been on the phone for you know like probably four to six hours today on COVID alone about this, that, keeping everybody informed, trying to figure out what has to be done to what particular school and that kind of thing. So um, as I said to the local boards of health, this is a, it's a tricky spot because I understand both sides. I understand the side where, you know, we need to have students in school and we need to be um, doing that. And I also understand the side of, um, it's very nerve wracking um, to see cases popping up in our community. It's certainly extremely stressful for teachers, you know, finding out, they have of certain things that, you know, there's been changes in their school due to COVID, a COVID event or someone's been quarantined or they have to quarantine because there may be possible exposure. Um, this, the term abundance of caution that was using there, we certainly are using abundance of caution. And, and while they say, you know, there's, you know, a play on words there back at me because I've used that in multiple of my letters. Some of our classrooms, you know, the, the classroom in, in Sunderland, you know, there's different interpretations of the rule. Um, whether or not the classroom should be completely shut down or not. And we went the most conservative route. Um, and so, you know, that has been kind of our our route. And so um, in a conversation, again, I, you know, I had earlier, um, you know, I, I also get the amount this, with the uptick in our community is an uptick of stress on people. And, you know, um, I know that's real. I, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, I don't have... Listen, I, I and I and I said this to I don't know if I said this to Jessica on the phone, but I said it to somebody else today at least I'm on the phone all day long. Um, that you know our goal was to create a model to bring students back in person to do it safely. Within our model, there was a, always a consideration that if things get bad, that we have a remote option. That was the whole purpose of why we set it up. So you know the question that you know I think you know you know Jessica was asking is now the time, Jessica. I'm, words in your mouth and I really shouldn't be but we had the conversation was is this the you know are, have we reached that moment um you know the let's say the board of health doesn't would I think the Sunderland board of health I don't want to put words in their mouth that don't agree with that at this moment um but you know I also you know as I said to the board of health there's also other things involved and as I was pushing for the week off um not week off week remote be very clear on that after Thanksgiving is it's also, it's not just the numbers. It's also, there's a, there's an emotional game here too. And people, you know, it's, it's tiring. It's tiring on not just the, not just, not just the leaders, it's tiring on our leadership. I'm not being the teachers rather, it's also tiring on the leadership. Um, and so putting all that together, that made sense. Um, so I don't know where Jessica, where that, you, you asked to, you know, to put this on the agenda and obviously I ran through Greg um, to make sure it was okay by the chair, but, I think you know, what were your thoughts going into tonight's meeting? And, and now there is a change, obviously, that the boards of health have 
you know, closed down for, um, I mean, remote for a week after Thanksgiving, worried about that, if there would be a surge and that kind of thing. Uh, I just questioned Darius. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so just to make sure I understand correctly, are all four towns plus Frontier closing down the week after Thanksgiving, or this is just referring to Sunderland? All four towns. The uh, three of the four voted. Uh, Conway didn't have a quorum, so they couldn't officially vote. But they voted. The language was to be remote for the four days of in-person instruction um, following the Thanksgiving break was what they voted on. So um, like again, that's hot off, hot off the press, so to speak. I left that meeting, turned on this meeting, and bingo. So I didn't have a chance to even, I haven't even told my principals yet. There were a couple that were there, but it, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I'll have to put out correspondence tomorrow to families to let them know of that change. Um, it, the, the real concern, they were additional concerns were, you know, you have college students coming back, um, which is, you know, that kind of thing. You're going to have families that are going to get together, um, even if they think they're doing it safely. Um, and, and there's going to be people that are, are absolutely, and I, I think with, the, you know, some of the Board of Health members actually said, is, let's just be careful that there are a lot of people who are, are following the guidance and are doing sacrificing family tradition and that kind of stuff this year. And we do have to, not everybody's out there breaking rules and that kind of stuff. But um, they just want to make sure that that's clear out there too, because there is a, you know, our community for, but it doesn't take a whole lot to cause a, a change in a spike. And so that was their, their overall thing. And I think where I kind of pushed where they said, you know, your thoughts and, you know, um, you know, I said, we, we put it in the board of health's hands there because, you know, there was a concern about what about some of our vulnerable learners, you know, we're going to still open up the buildings for them. Um, and um, a board of health member said, you know what, you have, there's a different types of, there's a different crisis. We have a crisis in education, which is the school committee's problem, which is this, you know, remote model, the hybrid model, you know, and those students who are vulnerable and those students who are not being, um, who are not being able to meet their complete needs right now based on whatever, we're trying our hardest, but, you know, we know it's not perfect. And then we have a health crisis at the same time. And so they said, don't mix the two. And if we're going to close down for a week, we're closing down, we're going remote for a week. I keep saying close down, don't let anybody misinterpret me there. We're going remote for a week. Um, you know, that's because there's a public health crisis. Not because, you know, um, and that, you know, we shouldn't be bringing partial students in and then, you know, it's either, you know, that kind of thing. And so it is a full, full group remote week, no vulnerable students in. So um, it, it was a very, it was recorded. It was a very good discussion, I thought, on behalf of the board. I guess that the local board, I mean, we have our own nurse leader, Meg Birch, is on this call here. And I don't believe she's actually a Board of Health member because she's the, she's the nurse leader for the whole district. Um, and I'm just wondering if, you know, what her views on this would be in terms of, you know, our, you know, concern about having the schools safe. Sorry, my computer is being glitchy. Um, you know, I think, I think we are, I'm continually impressed by the, um, if you will, of um, staff and students alike are doing in terms of the protocols. At this point, we have not had in-school transmission, um, which I think speaks highly of um, all of the efforts of our community. Um, we do have community spread right now um, at a which we haven't seen for a while. And so um, it is concerning. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, sorry, Peter, I wasn't fully prepared to, um, <laughs> I should have been, but I wasn't fully prepared. Um, it's been long days, as Darius said, lots and lots and lots of time on the phone and, um, and talking about things. Um, no, I've just been very impressed by the work that you've put into trying to and make sure that our schools are as safe as possible and all the all yeah. plans you've done and all the things you've done and so on. And yet we hear tonight from a couple members of the staff who have concerns about, uh, it basically comes down to the safety uh, in the right. school and safety for right. themselves and safety for the whole, um, you know, the whole communi school community as a whole. And so right. 
Um, I, I, you know, I think I, I will, you know, I think we, we walk a line. I mean, we're hearing them and, 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 you know, addressing those concerns in a sufficient way. Right. Um, I feel like I'm hearing them. I don't know if they feel heard. Uh, it sounds like some people don't. Um, and, um, you know, we, you know, I, 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 in addition to my role as district nurse leader, I also do contact tracing for the cooperative public health service towns um, through the FERCOG. And you know, when I look at things and I think about the strict um, lines for who's considered a close contact and who would go into quarantine, uh, you know, Darius can, can attest to this. We're, we're consistently uh, going beyond what the local board of health would do. Uh, and sometimes not, not easily. And sometimes with pushback, uh, advocating very strongly to say, look, this is, you know, it, it may be that that's a strict definition, you know, within six feet for more than 15 minutes. Uh, and and we we push back on that and we say look these these are people these are our, our these are staff these are students these are families um, we need to um, in, we need to make a decision that is going to, um, to to further mitigate risk to the to the to the degree that we can um, and and I feel like I feel like that that. I, I feel like we're very consistent on that, and I feel like we've we've gone beyond recommendations across the board um, for PPE in terms of what's available and what we're advising. Uh, I know one of the other districts, uh, the the building based nurse, told me that they're now requiring staff staff are going to wear face shields in addition to their masks at all times, um, just to add that additional layer of protection. Um, and, and we're supporting those kinds of decisions of of going beyond what. You know the state requires a mask. Period. Um, into the distance. So um, so far, um, you know the case in Sunderland and the um, other cases in this in the district. We know where transmission happened. It was outside of school. Um, can I say with certainty that that I can guarantee we won't have a case that's transmission transmitted within the school? Um, no, but I, but I can look to our protocols and I can look to the science that I read and have read around where is transmission happening and it's not happening in schools. It's happening in the community. It's happening in private homes. Um, you know, when I say community, it's, I mean, Berkshire County had a huge uptick of cases and those related to a series of, of parties and after parties of parties. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question, Peter. I mean, I feel like- um, No, you are, I think you're, I mean- There's a constant balance between, you know, I, I hear from the nurses, I hear from people about, um, some parents about, you know, the, their kids being back at school and how profoundly important that is for the kids. Um, and, then, and then I, you know, I balance, how how safe how safe can we possibly be or is there anything else we can be doing um and it's it's i don't know no i thank you i think that's i, I mean you you can never be totally safe okay you can you know you can you could whatever it's just not possible but if you're going um well past the point that you know, many others might stop and say that's enough, but we're going farther and, and so on, which I think is what we're doing. Then I think you have to say, okay, now we've still got to be able to somehow provide, you know, the best possible education for our kids at the same time under these circumstances. And right. um, so, no, I, I, I support what you're doing and I, I, I appreciate your, you know, your honesty because none of this stuff is easy. It's not easy. And we, and we can't, we cannot guarantee that we will not have a case in school. Um, can we do everything within our power to mitigate risk and to try to prevent transmission within our school? Um, yeah, we, we can, we can keep at that and we 
can we can be vigilant and we can follow the protocols with fidelity. Um, because with the mask wearing and the physical distancing and people staying home when sick, which families have been, um, I, I would say overall, um, and you know that that addresses when you know somebody's sick. It doesn't address when somebody is you know is pre-symptomatic. Um, but that that's where the 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 mask wearing and the distance um, provides those layers of protection. And I've talked all along about layers of protection. Um, okay. Thank you. So, Darius, would I would you add anything? I, I guess the only thing we're not giving you is like the solid one way or the other. And I think you can clearly see it because we're on the front lines of it. And it's it is it's um, you know you know. Um, the level of, you know, we've clearly, you know, we've had cases that have, you know, been in our school, so to speak, and that's a different, it's a different, uh, yeah, it's different. It, we knew this, it was kind of when I talked about it with my administrative staff, but, you know, all through this, we said, we're here, the, the, the different thresholds we have to get to, and one of them was when we have a case in our school. I mean, the whole reason we have six foot distancing, we have masks, and we have all the and cleaning and sanitizing procedure is because the fact that there could be a case in the school. That's why we put all those things into place. That was the it wasn't just for you know fun and games. It was the fact, the idea that that this is a, po a real possibility, and now it's it's happening. So you know, um, you know, I also know you know the idea of like what what is the threshold in the community um, for the amount of cases in the general community in which you close the school um, because out of precaution. You know, there is no and in, in this there's this is where I think there's big disagreement even amongst you can probably find anybody health officials state officials that kind of stuff where the state says you know you move forward there's no reason you're you're keeping kids protected at school um you're keeping you know the faculty are protected at school but it's you know i also know from the faculty's point of view that it's you know it's just concerning with if it's not your classroom a classroom across the hall suddenly had to go remote because there was a case in the classroom well and also you know it, it, there's an emotional side of this too it's not just science and that's you know i get it um you know so i don't I have a, I, I don't a, you know yeah i had i had a public health nurse say to me today um you know that we that we not it wasn't related to sunderland it was related to another to another school and they and their comment was that you know you're you're going too far in what you want to do do in terms of keeping you know who who you want to keep out and I said, you know, I feel like I need to go too far because I feel like this isn't just about, um, that this is about the staff and it's about the families. And so I would rather be criticized for going too far um, in, who, in who we have out than, than not far enough. Um, but it's tough, as Derry said, there's, there's two very, there's, there's different sides to it and there's different perspectives, so. Um, Megan Darius, have there been cases in the buildings before last week, or was that the first time it's come into the building? That's the first case. Uh, that, that's mm -hmm. the first. Yeah. And so we actually, when we went remote, we went remote, or when we switched to remote at the end of the week, we didn't know for we didn't know it was a case. Um, right. So we, we may have had we may have had and just to be just to be clear on that, Meg. We may have had people who may have been considered um close contacts and we had to wait for testing on other people but none of those tests came back positive so we had these in different buildings in the district we had different uh, call them scares um where you know we were waiting on testing to find out if someone you know you know you know saw a friend that uh, you know faculty and and students you know and obviously students who may have been, um, had flu-like symptoms and had to get tested and we had to wait for those those things but um I just want to say because in case some people were like, "Oh, I know people got tested," and this person was waiting. This is the first. This is the first uh, positive case. So the reason I'm asking that is that um, that really does mean the reason that we haven't had in school transmission yet is that COVID hasn't been in the building yet. Um, and I, I, I want to be the first to say that um, the worst of my fears that I had over the summer before we came back in person have not materialized. And I know that schools are not super spreaders. But schools are spreaders. Um, you know, we can't say yet because it's only been five days since 
since there was a positive COVID case in our building, we can't say yet that our masks and distancing are working. We could still have an in-school transmission. When I look at the state weekly report, there's now a page um, talking about clusters that they've identified in, in across the state. And it's really striking to me that they have, in last week's report, they had identified more clusters from K-12 schools than they had from restaurants, from hospitals, and from social gatherings in terms of the number of clusters. Um, you know, Darius, at one point you, you shared with us uh, the article in The Atlantic based on Peggy Oster's, um, no, Emily Oster's, the, the Brown University professor, her research, which has been roundly condemned for, for its methodology, um, that COVID is slowly spreading in schools. There is some spread in schools. Um, and so I would like us to have a conversation about if the time to pivot is now. Um, Darius and, and Meg, can you tell me, um, based on this revised metric, when the, when the report comes out from the state on Thursday and it says Franklin County has more than 50 cases, what happens then? It's it's the conversation with the boards of health. And it's just up to the boards of health. So, I mean. Well, it's a conversation with them. You okay. know, I think I think one of the things that, you know, we have we don't have the same amount of information that they have. So until we have a conversation with the board of health, um, I don't know of those cases in Franklin County, how many are in our towns, you know, and we're interconnected towns. So I, I don't say that to, to be dismissive of that. Um, but um, we do look to the boards of health to say, where, where are those cases? You know, what's happening? Because, because they have access to that information. We don't, we, ha we only have access to the information that impacts, directly impacts the school. If they, you know, and, and we have really positive relationships with our boards of health. So we're able to, you know, I'm able to call up our, our public health nurses or I'm able to email them and say, you know, you know, what's, what's the status? You know, where, where are you seeing cases? What's happening? Um, and that is, that continues to be important information. Um, but it, but I, it is a discussion. And then I think it is also, you know, it, it is up to the board of health to close us down. Um, so it's you know, like the discussion tonight, um, around, around what do we do, um, the concerns about Thanksgiving. I mean, it was, as Jerry said, it was a really good discussion about, um, all of, all of the, all of the issues and the concerns. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where we go. And, and I don't, you know, I know the, I know the case numbers are up. Um, I don't, I, I'll be honest, Jessica, I don't have a good sense of where those 66 cases are. Uh, when I did math for, for November 1st to November 14th, I got 66 cases, um, for that 14 day period. Um, I know today there was one case reported. Um, yeah, I think it was four and the day before it was five. Um, and I don't know if I don't know if that 66 is a reflection of Halloween, um, you know, uptick related to Halloween. And, and um, I know that overall in the state right now, the cases are mostly the 20 to 29 year old age group. Um, you know, it's not to say there aren't significant number of cases in other younger age groups as well. I don't feel like I've answered your question, Jessica. <laughs> so when the Thursday weekly report comes out and says that Franklin County has more than 50 cases, the boards of health are going to discuss what to do about that. When would the boards of health meet? They, we met last, um, well, besides the six o'clock, right. we met last Friday morning, at the Friday morning following that. And that's where there was the discussion as well about, that's where they made a plan to have a joint meeting to discuss the, the, the Thanksgiving week. Um, so, you know, that's, they have this, this bi-weekly phone call where we do that. So, um, you know, when the, when the results come out again on Thursday, you know, we, you know, we call the boards of health and I mean, we've been, we're talking to them every day, Jessica. So, we're talking to you. Um, so they'll you know, that, the weekly report probably on Friday. 
What's that? The, well, so the we, report will come out Thursday night and it's going to say that Franklin County has more than 50 cases. So then that will be discussed on Friday is what you're saying. Is there, um, there's not a set meeting for this Friday. So we would have to be calling the local boards of health and right. asking what they want to do. I mean, I've, I've been talking, you know, I have been talking with with our with our our public health nurses who are the ones who are you know following the cases within um maven um and i know darius you've been in touch you've been in, in conversation with multiple um boards of health chairs all week it's only tuesday but it feels like it's it's you know yeah we spend most like of hermione the and harry point. potter with a time turner I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, it, it's, it's ongoing discussions and, um, I don't know what to say beyond that. I, I just wanted to know how, how that policy was going to be implemented in practical terms. That was my question. Um, so I, I heard what two of our staff members said at the beginning of this meeting and I've, I've, had communications with other staff members this week. It is all very similar to what's happening in the district where I teach, where there there is great anxiety that you know our our precautions are not are not waterproof. They're not watertight. COVID can be transmitted. Um, I'll share with you a survey of my union. This is not Union Thirty Eight, but where I teach, um, fifty five percent of teachers said that they had considered requesting a leave of absence or resigning in the last month. I'm really concerned about staffing shortages in our building if if we stay in school when um, when the risks are this elevated. Um, I got an email from one of my kids Sunderland teachers today saying that because their child's daycare has had to close because of a COVID exposure, that teacher is now taking a leave of absence. You know, there are all sorts of circumstances that can happen that could lead to a staffing shortage. And that is, I mean, that's an educational concern that's very much the mm -hmm. policy purview of this committee, even if it's not public health. And so I would like us to be having a conversation about whether we should be out of an abundance of caution, as we like to say, if we should be pivoting to remote learning sooner. It would also help to take some heat off Darius, who's kind of stuck in the middle right now. <laughs> If I could jump in, um, I, I absolutely do want to say a, a couple of things. I, you, you're 100 percent right. I agree with you that uh, there's two sides to this. There's the incremental benefit to having kids hybrid versus remote, which is sort of our wheelhouse. And there's the incremental health risk of having them in person versus remote, which is obviously a public health issue. Uh, so I, I feel like it's not just for public health officials to dictate to us. We also have uh, obviously some agency and, and to say in, well, uh, how much how much better is it to uh, say, uh, have up until Thanksgiving and then have the break after Thanksgiving versus doing it sooner or, you know, uh, I don't feel like, for this, I'm not, I'm not advocating something right here right now, but I will say, I don't feel like it's outside of our responsibility to talk to that. Um, and and I do want to thank again, the, the teachers and the IAs and all the staff for uh, supporting what we've done today with, with the hybrid learning. And also I want to thank the administration for being communicative and also um, when the state or boards of health uh, give direction that is maybe uh, more aggressive than, than what the community or the staff are uh, ready for it to actually stand the ground and say, hey, uh, there's more to it than, than just viral counts and, and contact tracing. Um, well. I know that, uh, especially when we decided to, we voted not unanimously to go uh, hybrid. Um, also, the potential for a vaccine was 
there's nowhere on the horizon. Um, and we're in a different place now. We're, we're really trying to uh, make things work until we can get back to a, a more normal uh, school environment. Um, you know, I understand what, what the state is trying to do. Uh, thank you for clarifying that, Darius. At, at the same time, I do feel like uh, anyone who would audit our remote stuff would find it very robust. I'm, I'm very impressed with what we're doing uh, in, in these schools uh, with our remote learning. Um, I don't know. I guess that's what I have to say for now. Any other comments? Well, with regard to the pressure from the state for in-person learning, I want to point out that uh, more than half of the students in the Commonwealth have been fully remote this whole time. And we have a broader definition of priority students than DESE recommends. So we are already way above what they're looking at. We are not the target. Of yeah, the yeah. Right. I mean, and statistically, the major municipalities have all gone remote. So, you know, your population centers are remote. So if you're going to do a, you know, the, the population hubs like Springfield, your, you know, um, you know, Worcester's, your, you know, the, I think it's like seven districts make up 50% of the population of Massachusetts or something like that when you take the major cities. So, mm -hmm. uh, but also, yeah. it, it, oh, go ahead. But I just think, I, I, not that it's our, anything we can fix, but there's huge, they, their attendance is terrible for their online learning. And we're going to have a, we're going to struggle as a, as a state and as a nation to get those, those populations back on board. Luckily, we have a different problem here. We'll take I'll take our problem compared to the, some of those urban districts, um, but anyway, my bigger concern as a as a person of a citizen of Massachusetts, I guess. It's a good point. Locally, we we do have lots of neighbors who have have pivoted. You know, uh, Mahar is is remote right now. Gil Montague just went remote for the whole district for a single case, walking in their building. Exactly what we've just had. Hatfield is remote through Thanksgiving. Our, our, our comparable neighbors are pivoting. This is, we would not be the first. So Darius, what's, Darius, what's, what's, how much of a downside is there by doing what, as opposed to doing what's uh, uh, planned right now, which is remote for the week after Thanksgiving of just We've got four more hybrid days, if I'm correct, two this week and two beginning of next week before Thanksgiving. Um, I'm assuming that what Jessica would be in favor of even is that we just start the going remote right away. Is that fair? I want to hear from other committee members. I, I, I want to err on the side of safety. You know, if our failure to act did cause somebody in our, in our school community to become sick and, even you know, could even lead to disability or death, I would have a hard time with that. I would feel responsible for that. So I want to have this conversation. Yes, I, I would err on that side of safety, but I want to listen to the rest of you as well and see what the rest of you were thinking. I mean, I'm not sure. I don't know what, uh, you know, I don't know from a, from a, from a educational point of view, from a, just a pure administrative point of view, does it, uh, you know, how much of a, you know, you, you're managing, obviously, you know, whatever we do is, has been a huge challenge for all of you because of, of, of how much more difficult it makes, you know, already difficult process. And, and, and so, you know, changing what these four more days before Thanksgiving to, to remote, um, I'm assuming can be done. I'm assuming that there's a downside because we generally feel that, that the remote is not as good an education and there's a downside for a number of families who, you know, are counting or wanting their, their, their kids in school as, as much as possible for a variety of reasons. Um, I don't know, Darius, you got, you got a opinion about that as to why. Can I make one quick response to that? Fully remote education is stronger than hybrid remote because the teacher can focus on everybody being in the same format. That's all. Darius, you got a sort of opinion well, on that? So, you know, what is the, what is the, I mean, you're, you're asking kind of a loaded question. It's not, you know, we are, we have a system that's prepped that's ready to go remote. So if the committee decides to go remote, you know, it is not as strong, especially in the younger grades as the in-person model, but, 
you know, if it, the sense is like the basing that, you know, a decision, there's going to be, there's going to be negative size to any side. There's, we're, if it was an easy decision, we would have made it. Right. You know, um, you know that's that's the you know, that's the kind of thing. It wouldn't be going bouncing around to to the committee, and then, so I understand. Like, do we is the abundance of caution? Well, everybody's like going to beat up on that. I got to find a new term now for my new letters. Um, it, it, with the abundance of caution, does that include closing for four days prior, now? Okay, so you know what is and then is it you know if I'm recommending that as a leader. Um, what is the precedent? So what's the numbers coming out of the Thanksgiving break, the week after the Thanksgiving break? Is it because of just where we are right now? We just want to stop and catch our breath, so to speak. I can, I can, I, can, I, can, I wouldn't mind catching my breath, but so I, I, I understand that. Um, but, you know, so you're saying like educationally, there's, there's going to be, there's some losers whenever you go to um, people who are going to lose out who, without the in-person model. And we have vulnerable learners that need to be in the building. Um, however, you know, I think the, um, you know, the, the, our, our remote model is, is strong. So, I mean, I don't think it's based, I don't think that that's the way you should be basing your decision on. Because you're talking about safety in overall numbers, or you're talking about um, the level of anxiety within our community that we need to kind of settle that as well. Um, you know, those are different than you know, the balancing out of the educational model, you know, I, I think. Yeah, you know? Darius, if, if I may, I, I think you said uh, all you can say and and uh, about up, up the limit of it. Uh, Peter, just to fill in some of the blanks, uh, obviously, if Sunderland as one elementary school goes a different direction than other ele elementary schools, that is uh, a bit of a headache for the district. Um, and of course, um, you know, there, it would maybe create some tension with the local board of health because uh, they may see us as stepping on their toes a little bit and i know that uh, uh, you are invaluable uh, on this committee in helping to maintain good relationships with the other town government stuff so i, I know we, we certainly wouldn't want to uh lightly uh you know, step on anyone's toes but uh yeah it, it, it's our decision obviously darius with with four schools and and also the frontier uh can't really tell us what to do. We, we've got to make up our own minds. Right. And, and legally, legally speaking, even though you're you're part of a, a superintendency union, you have the, the authority on this thing. And so if you decide to do something tonight, you know, I, I'm not going to influence your decision based on my workload. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. So, you know, if I have to, you know, obviously if you go one route, I would then have to contact other chairs and decide if they want to do something as well. But I, I on something of this topic, if we were talking about, I don't know, how we're doing the books, you know what I mean? And, and it's yeah. gonna cause so much more work for my office to give you certain kind of reports for certain kind of things. And that's a different kind of conversation than we're talking about, um, you, know, a, a, you know, a pandemic topic, you know? So um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, you know it'd, be, it'd be more work, but that's not the, that should not, my workload is not the basis of your decision. <clears throat> Go ahead. Like I was just going to say, I think, um, Darius, you made reference to sort of when, when, what, what would we be looking at to come back? What's, what's the plan? What's the plan to come back to hybrid? You know, so if, if, if there's a pause, if, if we sort of say, you know what, there's, there's too much uncertainty in terms of the numbers um, and, you know, concern for the well-being of staff and in and, and the holistic sense, not just in terms of um, are we protecting, you know, are the pr protocols protecting them from COVID, but um, overall, overall well-being. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm, I'm asking the question because I don't have a, and I don't have a clear answer, I'll be honest, of, of if we say, the indication the indicators now say we should we the, the school should be remote um fully remote learning and then we do the pause after thanksgiving what what's the what's the clarity or what's the what's the point where we say now we can we can, can we can reintroduce the um the hybrid in-person learning 
uh, for for the students and safely do so. I don't know. We can't hear you, Greg. You're muted, Greg. I'm supposed to be unmuted. Can you hear me now? Okay. I want to um, back up something Jessica said, which, uh, again, um, I understand the local boards of health have data that's beyond what's available to us. And I don't want to know. Okay, I get it. Um, at the same time, uh, this isn't the first time that uh, there's been some sort of a threshold set where, well, if we cross the threshold, we're, we're going to do something. And and then, uh, well, uh, but it's a special case. It was uh, a small, closed group. So we're not going to, uh, to take action. Um, so it kind of goes both ways to Jessica's point. Uh, you know, first of all, we are seeing uh, a sharp increase in the number of cases um, across the country, across the state. Uh, we are going into this uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, I know that for me, talking to teachers and talking to social assistant staff about being in school, and this is, I don't want to take that on the administration because it's more an issue with the board itself. It would make that a lot easier if there were really clear, consistent criteria where uh, we, we went over this line, we turned red, and even though we could say, yeah, but we should still be in school, we're going to go remote because we crossed the line and we said when we crossed the line, we we're going to go remote. Um, I guess the best answer I, I would have for that is, uh, we're worried about seeing a, a post Thanksgiving spike. Uh, if we're in a direction where the board of health and the state are saying, yes, please do go back to school, and we don't see the post Thanksgiving spike, that, then obviously whether we do uh, an earlier pause or whether we follow the, the state or the local board of health recommendations of doing just the Thanksgiving pause, uh, we, we would go back probably uh, again if that post Thanksgiving boom doesn't emerge. So my gut reaction is, I think we pivot now. It's four remote days. I think we do it. And I think worrying about how we go back into hybrid, I, it is a concern, but we we can't call it till we get there. Take the pause after Thanksgiving and see what the landscape looks like, have the conversations and figure it out then. One benefit to pivoting now is that it will functionally for a lot of families help them to do a short-term lockdown going into Thanksgiving when a lot of families will take risks. It will actually help to mitigate the after effect of Thanksgiving. Keith, have I heard from you yet? Any thoughts? I'm not really sure where the conversation is going to be quite honest because I, I looked at the agenda and I saw phase three. So I came in planning to talk about to actually press Darius on why we were going to open further. Um, because I absolutely believe that um, putting a, a young person in front of a, an educator, a mentor is, is extremely valuable. I look at coming out of this, education is going to be completely changed. It could be completely changed. I remember when I started, it was 21st century learning models, 21st century, 21st century built on a 19th century agrarian model. Right? So I think start time is going to be, can be completely rethought. I think attendance can be completely rethought. Everything complete, can be completely rethought, except I think the one thing that has been absolutely cemented is children in front of learned adults is the most important thing. This idea that we can fully remote teaching after this is all over, we could, the most important thing is students the teachers and I want to try to my whole mindset has been how can we serve the kids of our district in this regard we got to do something so but I was going to press with everything going on now and uprises every I mean um, upticks everywhere why are we going to, to, to four days to two I'm so confused because I, I think all of a sudden it was like I, I didn't see anything on agenda about going completely remote so I I, I was a little take I'm, I'm a little taken aback where we are now um I, I no I wouldn't I, I don't even what happened in Sunderland? I heard there was a case, and I know the property is really important, but 
I don't, I, re I don't really know what happened. I don't know where the case was. I don't, I don't really have any specific, I don't, I can't really, I don't have any specifics to really make a decision on. And I've been through this myself. My employee, employee test positive this summer. I had to do the contact tracing. I had to deal with the fears that everybody else had. I had to be the one to tell people, well, you didn't really qualify for contact, even though you were next to this person based on these parameters. You, I had to tell the person, go out and get tested yourself, which was terrible. Uh, so I know, I, I, I feel what it, I have felt what it is like to have that, that worry. Um, but we also, in, from my experience, uh, we were doing the right things and there was no further transmission. And subsequently that person actually tested negative and, and not that that it's going to transfer to Sunderland Elementary, but uh, I think that the taking a pause after Thanksgiving would be prudent. I, I don't think I can argue that one. I think that maybe taking a week and seeing where things go uh, would be prudent, but I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be uh, supportive of pivoting right now based upon what I know. Uh, and and certainly um, excellent points. And I know we, we all agree that uh, the sooner we can get kids into the schools and in front of teachers, that that's obviously the the best thing. Um, and 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 I will add just to um, from my my experience, my district uh, it took a different hybrid model. It was a staged reopening. I haven't seen my students ever. I haven't seen them at all. And and the remote teaching is terrible. I mean, I'm, I'm having a yeah. doing the best I can, but just the whole system is not. I got, I have, I had pretty good experience last spring. I have a half dozen students that I can't get in contact with. That's way more than I had, and it's really, really frustrating when they can just click and then I can't. They're gone. I can't do anything with them. I think the most important thing. Look at my kids. They they appreciate the days that they can go into school. They say it's weird. It's quiet. That's the one thing they keep saying. It's quiet. The mat is just quiet and. But they look forward to going into school. They they looked forward to participating in sports. They look forward to it. I think it's really healthy. Um, strict the the metrics when they were deciding the spring, it was a dart and a dartboard. No one know how many cases it, per one hundred thousand residents or, and I appreciate that our district has taken a measured approach and not just blindly decided. Well, we hit this. Let's do which my district did. And they brought kids back for about 10 days and then shut down again. And right now, there, I believe there's a petition of over 100 families petitioning the school community to open up in Amherst. So there's tremendous pressure to ignore the districts that, I mean, the, the metrics that they have put in place and uh, families are pressuring them to come back. I, I like the approach that we've taken. I think it's been measured. Um, but that's, that's was just my thoughts. Thank you. Um, All right, Greg. My my understanding is that the, the the second grade that was involved in this is remote for some period of time now already. Derek, you want to talk to it? I know it was. Yes, uh, Meg, you want to get the just jump in the you use all the right terminology. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, well, what I can share is that um, the the individual who was positive, we do understand that it was um, family workplace transmission, um, family members, um, and um, again, and I, you know, as Darius said, yeah, that the our phrase no longer feels so good to say the abundance of caution, but we went beyond what would have been considered the strict definition, and the students and who in that in that learning group um, switched to remote learning um, basically uh, uh, between now and the Thanksgiving they're remote they're remote until Thanksgiving um, and now the the week after so um, they, they have been out they've been um, provided information by our um, school nurse and um, I believe we're contacted by the public health nurse today um, to provide them with additional information. Our expectation is that they would be um, quarantined and out until the 
I think they, yeah, the sometime around Thanksgiving is is that period of time. Um, and they're all recommended to be tested, um, you know, and to continue to monitor. Um, and we also, you know, when uh, the, 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 death, the, the public health looks at um, 48 hours prior to somebody becoming symptomatic or somebody testing, you know, having this, the test uh, sample taken, um, and we actually went, um, we went 72 hours um, rather than the 48 um, because it just made sense, more sense to us given the, the little information we had. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's tough. Peter, I see you shaking your head. It's just, it's like, man, I don't want to vote for any of these. It's just, no. you know, the reasons, the reasons to vote that, you know, I mean, I think about, you know, just the straight concerns of the staff is, is, is reason to vote to, to flip right now. And on the other hand, we've got, you know, the best, you know, what I believe we've been trying to do all along, which is, you know, respect the data, respect the science, have a, you know, totally, uh, you know, informed as possible uh, nurse operation that's that's really front and center in all these decisions, you know, who have basically said, you yeah, know, okay, we're, you know, this is what they're recommending. Um, it's just, it's hard to, you know, you can't vote for both. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Honest to God, I don't know. Uh, and I'm normally a pretty decisive person, but it just is like, you know, you, I don't know. I mean, what are we going to do? Are we going to vote on this thing? Is that... Uh, well, we, we'd have to make a motion. We'd have to create a vote. And I'm not trying to get Q to split the baby, but then I, I also wonder, do you go you stay hybrid through this week um so that families have a little more notice um but i i do and i i thought the same thing that jessica said which is uh our measures have been tested only slightly we did have students in schools uh who were who tested positive and did not transmit them through the schools so that's uh it's not a lot of data and I, I, you know, you don't want to try your luck. Uh, sometimes you, you gotta no one to take your winnings and leave the casino. Um, but yeah, we, we don't know how robust these measures are going to be long-term and we do have, um, I, I, I'm also persuaded by the argument that by providing a little time in advance of a Thanksgiving holiday, uh, it will give the families a chance to isolate going into it. You know, the funny thing is, I thought all along back when we were talking, in, you know, early early uh, fall or deciding what plan we we're going to do and so on. You know, I, I was, number one, I was pretty sure that we were going to be revisiting it. And I thought we were going to be revisiting it a lot early, a lot sooner than we are. Yeah. Because right? I thought there were going to be well, you know, more cases around and it was just going to be, you know, this is this decision is going to be for now, but it's not going to stick necessarily. And that, uh, uh, and I also thought that, boy, we got one case in the school and we shut down. And that was my feeling yeah. then, that, that regardless of what you thought that was going to happen. And the only reason that I, you know, again, I'm conflicted now is because I really am impressed by uh, you know Meg's work and the and 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 the involvement of the professional <laughs> medical people in this whole operation in terms of trying to give us the best guidance possible. Um, this is their guidance, but I still, boy, I like I said, I was always assuming one case, and boy, you know, it's gonna we got to shut down for a little while, and and I don't know. If we have a vote. I'm going to have to vote, but I'm not sure yet. So. I'd like to encourage y'all to listen to the people who are actually in the classrooms. Um, I, 
Another data point from my district, not from Union 38, but my union survey, more than half of teachers felt that, I think, in fact, I, I think it was 73%, almost three quarters of teachers felt like COVID could be transmitted in their classrooms with what they saw of gaps in the, the fidelity of the safety precautions. You know, it's very hard to, to monitor the learning of a child from six feet away. The staff are constantly within six feet of their students. There are kids whose masks are falling off their, their faces. There are kids who have very legitimate mask exemptions. There are gaps. Somebody want to make a motion if you want to, otherwise yep. we'll move on. Exactly. So Darius did check with the attorney today on um, this. We think this qualifies as an emergency. So that's why it was added within 48 hours of the meeting that we could make an emergency motion. Um, I'm, oh, I, I'm happy to make a motion. I can either move that we pivot for Thursday or pivot for Monday to give everybody warning on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and for optics, well, let me take the hit. I'll make the motion to pivot starting Monday, uh, going into through the, the Thanksgiving, uh, you know, the post Thanksgiving week uh, to full remote learning. No second. Seconds. Okay. Uh, Maisie. Yes. Keith. Is it, is it no? No. No. Okay. Uh, Jessica. Yes. Peter. Yes. And I'm going to vote yes. So it's uh, four to one. Thank you. All right. And I guess after that, we're on to capital planning. Uh, for just for some clarity, just so I know administratively. So the plan is to return to the hybrid model that we're currently in. Um, I can't pull up that screen, sorry. Um, on um, my calendar here, on <clears throat> December 7th, we will return to the current hybrid model. Yeah, obviously pending uh, the local board of health recommendation to the contrary. I mean, if we're closed, if we're closed, if, they, if we're closed, yeah. we're closed. But the game plan is that the, the, we're returning to this model, that this is not based on numbers yep. or whatever it, it's based on the, the at this point in time we need to pivot we'll call it that term we need to pivot at this particular time around this holiday and that we're returning to um the, the model we're in we were in today starting on monday the 7th did you need did you need a vote to to us approve the post thanksgiving week of remote only like i thought you said you were getting in other towns no, no, the the, um, the Board of Health did it. So okay. you guys actually, technically, they, they shut it down due to pandemic reasons. You actually couldn't override their shutting of something down. Okay. If that's where they actually supersede you in the sense of the Board of Health has the, you know, right. one guy could challenge it, I guess. But I think they, they have the authority to say that medically, I mean, um, Meg, am I, you're, am I guessing right, correct here? The Board of Health has the authority to say that, you know, that they're, you know, pandemic wise, that this, that this, the district needs to shut down. Right. So I'm just, I just want to make sure because there was talk about like, you know, our matrix and our metrics, rather, matrix, <laughs> that's what it feels like. Um, their metrics and that kind of stuff are, you know, what's the question of those kind of things and that, um, you know, with the next thing on the thing is we're going to talk about phase three, which we're not looking to unroll tonight. Okay. Just, just keep just to, <laughs> as, a, as a side set. But, um, the, uh, I just want to make sure where we are, we are moving forward, because I think that's going to be the first thing the teachers are going to ask me is like, so on the 7th, do we just come back? Um, and so my understanding is yes, unless the Board of Health is showing us that there's numbers or we have more community spread that um, makes us go back to the drawing table. Is that right. what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's the plan. Okay. Right now. Good. Yeah. Um, Greg, do you want me to go into phase three? Um, so, 
Keith, exactly right. When you look at what the heck is phase three doing on this thing when we're talking about um, increasing things. So basically where this comes from, there's actually logic, um, is that mid-October, I met with my principals and said, listen, um, we need to, what does the next phase look like? We have this plan to get us to the end of October. Um, I released the, at that point, or he had just released or was about to release um, the November calendar. And I said, we, what are we gonna do after November? We continue to have the good numbers that we had at that particular time, which were very low. Um, that kind of thing is, can we bring more students back? Can we look at our educational model now and what does it look like for the second half of the year? I mean, if we're gonna make some adjustments, we need to do them. Some of the models, and we did this by building, and some of the models and some of the building are, are unreasonable to continue long-term for teachers. The, some of these models where um, they're teaching dual from in front while teaching um, uh, teaching with students in front of them while teaching um, students at home, um, very difficult, extremely difficult and it, it extremely draining. And so the idea was, let's start talking with the teachers, how can we shift things? And we had some immediate you know, ideas of, you know, now that we kind of uh, have done this for a while, how can we shift those ideas? So basically tonight's presentation was or is, um, Ben's gonna share with him with the general ideas that he's been going over talking with staff about, um, about where we could go. Because if these numbers, if the COVID numbers do come down, you know, how are we gonna continue to, you know, I have been pressing um, in-person education. I think it's important. And I think it's with you safely. And I think, I think I've been very clear from the beginning. Um, and we have to look at, we have to keep planning forward. You can't, you know, sit and hold. And so this was the idea of where we are with this phase three model. So. Um, I guess that's the that's kind of the rollout. It just so happens that not only are you the last meeting of all these, you're a week later than last week was a tough week because the numbers the numbers have gotten worse in the last three weeks. And when I created this agenda, it was three weeks ago. So because I you know we're doing all the schools the same basic agenda with this phase three. So that's the um, the optics of that looks so terrible. Um, when we start this phase you know, has not been ironed out yet. And so, and then obviously um, this week's news and last week's news of uptick in cases changes that. And we we will pivot on that as well. You know, um, there's nothing, this is not a top-down edict that we're forcing that to, to happen. It is a time for us to reflect, how do we change our, how do we change our educational model? Can we get more students in and do it safely? And um, so that was the, that's my introduction speech. So then you, are you still there? Ben, fall asleep? No, not yet. Uh, almost. So I was trying to remove, uh, excuse me, unmute. Um, yeah, so I've been having discussions with individual cohorts uh, across the school and uh, continue to have those discussions and there's um, more coming up as well. Um, the purpose, uh, or if we were to switch to an increase of in-person learning, we want it to. We would want it to benefit not only the students but the teachers as well. Um, one thing Darius mentioned is the dual platforms in teaching remotely or remote students and in-person students at the same time is is very difficult. Um, some teachers have commented that on their uh, classes remote days they are able to get more planning done. Um, and one of those reasons being that specials are taking place in the classrooms this year. So those prep periods um, that usually happen when the kids are outside of the classroom are now, um, those, their classrooms are full of kids. So they're able to get more planning done on, the, on their remote days. Uh, teachers, like I mentioned, have talked about the difficulty of uh, teaching kids at home and in person at the same time. So if we were to be switching to a new model, we've started discussions about um, possibly changing some things up and um, looking at how we're using staff and uh, to deliver the different subjects. We're looking at the numbers of students who are hybrid and remote across all of the grade levels and um, looking to possibly blend some learning groups so that potentially um, when a teacher is in person, they would be responsible for their in-person students. And those who are uh, remote for that classroom or for that grade level might be receiving the same instruction, but from uh, another 
teacher or someone else in, in the building, all in an effort <clears throat> to um, take away that burden of teaching both at the same time. Um, so, and, and there are different uh, feelings and views about that across the entire um, across the entire building. And so I don't want to make like a blanket statement for everyone. Um, but some teachers, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I don't want to give up um, any of my students. It's the perfect group. We're really clicking on all cylinders right now. And I really do want to um, do the dual model where some folks um, think that they might be able to get more out of their students um, if they we kind of divvy up the responsibilities. So that's kind of like like what we're looking at right now. I don't have a. Um, uh, absolute definite plan for for every single grade level and those discussions are are continuing um but that's kind of just the that's the gist of it i'd be happy to answer any questions anyone Thanks, and I, think, and, and I was only to throw in there that uh, this is the and I think it's important to understand that this is the kind of how this, how this, not kind of, how this was rolled out was principals talk to your staff, build this together because um, doing a mid-year change, you have to have not only, and, and change, people have seen what we've been doing and now let's take the information we have um, and how can we improve upon it? Because, and, and this looks different in each building. Um, that's why we're doing it by building because different size schools have different problems and the one size fits all for the 38 union um, doesn't work. You know, uh, Deerfield is looking at something very different because of the number, the sheer number of students they have in their in their staffing. And you know, Waitley looks is, is looking different, and Conway's looking different. So the idea is to build it with the teachers moving forward. And so the rollout time of this right now, um, we don't even have a time on, in this particular model. There are some in other buildings where they are trying to schedule dates of rolling out models. So there are dates out mm -hmm. there um, that you might be hearing from. Um, other buildings because they are moving um, based on, you know, in, in some cases, you're only moving a few students to change a whole grade level to be in person every day, you know, um, where you can do small things to make big changes in, in educational instruction where Sunderland is, um, you know, it's got, got the heaviest, uh, you know, 65, 45, um, you know, remote to um, in person. So um, what, what was your eye, Ben? What's, what's the number there? Because that's 110%, 65, 45. So. Yeah, don't worry. I'm I'm just in charge of a uh, yeah. of a couple million dollar budget. Don't worry about my right. number. Yeah, but aren't we supposed to be giving 110 percent all the time? Yeah, that's that's probably where I got that, Peter. I'm always giving 110 percent. You know, I I um did put out to staff a, a target date uh for the beginning of January, um but that can I mean that can be flexible. Obviously, you know, like Darius mentioned, some some schools are looking at to do this, looking to do this in in December, um. And, you know, my particular mindset was that it was a little bit too early, especially with obviously Thanksgiving coming up and December is a crazy month as it as it is. And I, I'd be looking for kind of a smooth, smooth transition. Um, but we we really are kind of in the, the beginning phases of these these discussions. And and if we are to make this shift, um, it we would want it to create something that is more more sustainable for for our teachers um, and, and students for that matter. What are you doing about gathering input from teachers, not just about how to make it work, but whether they feel ready for it? That's through individual um, conversations. Jessica, I haven't set out, sent out a school-wide building survey, but that's just in like small group conversations. Will there be more steps? In terms of, in terms of what, sorry. In terms of getting input from the teachers or is this just an administrative process from here on out? Uh, no, it's, it's not an admin process, I, I think. I, I mentioned that it's we've been having cohort discussions and those are continuing. My remaining concern about the what mechanisms are we going to have in place to make sure 
you know, because schools committee sets policy, what is the policy to make sure that we're only adding students when it is safe to do so? Whether that is this committee votes on a metric that is pre-approved, whether we have to have an, a vote at the time, whether it needs to depend on a board of health consult, what's the mechanism? So that's, you know, and, and this is particular to this, this committee is what does this committee's role want to be within that? So, um, you know, other committees, you know, this is the, the fifth committee talking about the, you know, the fifth committee meeting this month where we talked about this phase three rollout and other committees are, this is within the role. You said that you're going to expand upon bringing more students back. You're going to present us on how you're going to do that. Um, and that's how we're moving. If the committee wants to have an approval process to that, then let's set up an approval process of what does it look like to bring students back in, in those kind of thresholds. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, I, I think part of the, it's not just the phase three, yes, we're talking about more students, but you know, it's also changing the model itself and helping the, you know, um, to, be, to improve upon that as well. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a two kind of a two prong thing. And so and I know we, we were, you know, obviously after the last discussion, talking about bringing more students back, it's kind of feels unheard of, but you know, the safety, if, if you're adding in, in certain classrooms, really, if you're adding a, a, a handful of more students um, and you have the teachers involved in that decision-making process to, you know, what does it look like? Can we do this safely? And that kind of thing. Then it's, you, yes, you're adding more students, but it, it, you're, the system you're putting in place is gonna be a better system. And so do you increase risk with each individual student you bring in the classroom? Sure. Is it, is it, does it outweigh the, the idea of bringing more students back in, in, a, in, a, in a safe way? I don't think so. I think the idea is try to, we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we improve on the hybrid model and um, getting more students back in person? So it's that kind of balance. And so if the school committee wants to have us bring the plan in December to vote upon, you know, um, I don't know if we're going to know if we're, if the, the the execution date is January. You know, I mean, I guess we could we could lay that out, but I don't think we're going to have good COVID numbers. You know, what I mean, I mean, this is a kind of a thing where we're going to be watching it all through the holiday season and whatnot. But maybe we do tentative dates and that kind of stuff and tentative plans. Um, and Ben, I'm not even sure if you're going to be ready by. We'd be ready by. When's the, when's the Sunderland meeting in December? Actually, you guys might be the second week, so you, I mean, the third week. Um, 15th, that's a few weeks. We may have a better idea by then, Ben. We can present it, bring it to this committee to present. Yeah, and, and I think making, making the switch to an Darius commute. Did you say Darius, commute? Yeah, yeah, making, the switch to an increase of in-person learning for our um, non-vulnerable learners, um, it's, it's not simply straightforward because our teachers right now, as it is, are still teaching the in-person and students uh, and at-home students at the same time. So we'd be looking at ways to, um, if they want, um, if they're up for it, if we could come up with some creative solutions to to ease that burden, which would allow for um, better better programming for both the remote students and um, and hybrid students at the same time. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the flexibility. I, I understand that, uh, you know, uh, some of the transitions that were happening maybe uh, caught people a little off guard, but I, I do get that they were sort of initiated in the classroom and happened in a few different towns slowly. And there, there is this whole uh, boundary of what's policy and what's procedure and, and where do the, the school committee stand. But uh, definitely it, it makes sense to plan for it when it's possible. Uh, and uh, and I, I get that also that. Uh, you can do a better job of monitoring the students in person if you're also not focused on, on the remote at the same time. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll add a review of, of what you're thinking to the agenda for December and, uh, and have a discussion then. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. More on this? 
Anyone? All right, let's uh, on to capital planning. So the timeline for capital planning is so we'll present this. I'm presenting. I, I the entire. The um, I send all of you their capital planning worksheets. Um, we have one where it's there. It's our workbook. That's a live document that could change at any time. That's this actually really showing full transparency. It's like our work. It's our workbook that we work out of for this year. Um, I sent all of you that, and I also sent um, Ben created a just the kind of priority page um, of that workbook. So. Um, basically, the kind of timeline wise, as I also know it's getting late, and I know people are getting, getting tired um, with me, it's just me. Um, but we, we'll go through, uh, I can present my screen, we can go through the ones that we're looking at for this year. It's going to be a difficult year financially for the towns. And so I think we're, but I think we still need to be prudent to show what the needs are for the, for the facility um, and in, in our planning there. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up, um, the, the comprehensive list. Um, and don't look at that because that's Conway. So here we are with Sunderland. Um, and also, so we did update this page for those of you, uh, if you haven't had a chance to, and I always sent it out this afternoon, but um, it, it does go, if you scroll right, it does go into what year was funded, how was it funded, what was spent in, in of, of that kind of thing. So we're trying to do an even better transparency of showing what, what, what's, um, what's happening. Um, and also, I think it's, it's great to have transparency, and I think I've heard it from um, this committee and other committees about what we've completed. Because you know, we start asking for someone's like, didn't we just buy that? Or didn't we just do that? What happened to the money we approved last year? You know, those are, those are common you know, terms that you know, people who are not following us day in and day out. So you know, having that transparency, and, and also with the town saying, whatever happened to what we did last year, um, they can see all that. Um, so basically, you can kind of, um, you can not just kind of, you can see where we're at this year. Um, ben, do you want to take over again? This is your neck of the woods, and so to speak. No, I can't see you. So, sure. Um, so, do you want me to talk about what uh, we're bringing for consideration at this point? Yeah, I think we're just talking about what's green and blue there. What we're talking about, and then people can kind of look down and again. Um, Okay. Yeah. So what, what screen there? Uh, number one, the exterior rim band repairs. Um, we have a contractor lined up for that. It's uh, It's been their absolute busy season. Um, I talked to uh, Bill Hildreth about that, our facilities director uh, today. And he said, realistically, they, they might be able to squeeze it in before the snow comes, but um, there's a good chance that rim band will happen between the end of the school year and July 1st. The, the flooring, uh, that's in progress as well. We replaced the flooring in the main office and the guidance area, and we did not uh, replace the carpeting yet in the library, and there was just going to be too much of a big crunch to moving the thousands of books out of that space and all the um, desks and shelving and so on and so forth um, from when the time the project started in the other rooms to the start of school. So that is, um, that, that job is pending, but we have it, we have everything picked out. The, uh, carpeting has been ordered and is, is ready to be rolled out as soon as that, uh, as soon as we give the go ahead. Moving on to the blue section, we're looking at, uh, phase two of the rim band. So that would be another $9,500. Um, the replacing of the rotten gable vent trims of, and the failing soffit. That's been on the list for a, full, a few years now. And so we moved up, moved it up to a number one priority. The, the, kitchen, the kitchen equipment, and um, this is the big one right here. Last year we had our steamer and kettle boiler welded just to make do for this year, but re it really is on its way out. Our kitchen doesn't use the kettle portion, and so they're looking to purchase or have a double steamer uh, piece of equipment purchased, which would really help them. So that's a that's a big um, necessity. The other two have been uh, grouped together, and they all deal with the our oil tank inspection, spill protection, uh, creation of a manhole, and the replacement of the oil tank gauge. 
one thing that we cannot assess at this time is what shape the oil lines are leading from the tank to the to the building um, if one of those lines were to go we would have a a mini environmental disaster on our hands in that area and it would end up costing a heck of a lot more money um, than what's listed on this sheet to get that cleaned up um, and also you know it's we're in, we're in the wetlands there so that's a whole nother whole nother issue the those are grouped together where it says replace oil oil tank remote gauge one thing our custodian is doing right now since the gauge isn't working he's taking a, a dipstick to measure the oil levels to make sure we're not too low um, and also another on top of that the safety pr protection that we have in place is automatic delivery um, but that's uh, that's why it is together and so you would consider that if we're going to be working on the um, oil tank, let's just do the whole shebang at once. So those are the uh, items that are up for consideration for FY22. The And sorry, uh, one other thing I did want to mention is that uh, Bill and I discussed uh, the window replacements. And as we know, the many of the windows on the south side of the building are compromised and we are wondering if it also makes sense to turn this into a phased project just like the uh, rim band is, uh, is what's happened with the rim band right now basically for the windows whatever the cost of materials is you'll you'll double each hole with with the labor um, so if it's a thousand dollars in in materials, you're looking at a $2,000 window. So it's it's pretty expensive. And that's, that's what we have. Outstanding. Questions? Um, just a couple of things. The idea had been that flooring was gonna be something that there was a chunk of money put in each year uh, to do three rooms and it didn't it didn't make the the top of the list here because you got the stuff for the cafeteria i guess um don't like to be have it not disappear because that was the idea was it sort of needs to get on a program to be doing that yep and and honestly peter we we think at this time the the oil tank issue and the cafeteria um, equipment is of a bigger priority right now. Okay. Can we make sure this year that stuff gets then in, submitted to the town, not only in a timely way, but also the town has got forms that they want this stuff submitted on. And I know last year when we came around to the evening of the meeting that was going to say yay or nay to this stuff, and Ben, you were chasing around because it didn't seem the town like the town had it and you were fortunately able to chase them down and get them and we got the stuff approved but it'd be nice to be a smoother process this year so just put that in the back of your mind just just for clarity's sake it was on their end because i submitted it i understand but sometimes it's just you know a check-in I'll, check I'll send it to everybody this time instead of uh, have you got person. all have you got all our stuff you know, can 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 see if there's a problem rather than just sort of assuming that everything's hunky dory. So. Yeah. So process wise, we'll we'll vote on it at the next meeting, and then I'll get those things. I'll probably even get them typed up and ready to go, and we can just you know um, when they're voted on, I can just finalize them. Okay. They're due January fourteenth, Darius. Okay. There's Shelley. And the town, the town will have some money to spend on capital projects because it has. A chunk that each year comes through the tax rate that's specifically for capital and um so you know we should be able to get our share and you know so not going to be and remember we had the capital committee came out and visited last year and kind of did a walk through so they the transparency and what our needs are and they've seen it with their own eyes they you know they they picked away at the rotting sill they saw it with their own eyes so they know exactly you know um they know exactly what the list is coming and yeah. so hopefully it'll be even smoother on their end too good and and bill is also exploring some grant options for 
the windows and hoping some, something will pop up for that. Um, not, nothing as of yet, but it's, it's such a big expense that uh, we're hoping to have some help with it. Great. I just want to say, I appreciate the shared document too. having gone before the capital planning committee. The first thing they ask is past projects. And I did not have that Rolodex in my mind that I could pull it out and it was kind of speechless. So that the fact that I can uh, refer to this, especially for past projects and how money is spent is really important. Yeah. You're going to have to give some credit to Shelly. That. Shelly made it Excel friendly, super, you know, kind of all the way through. So it, thank you, Shelly, for doing that. Yeah, and we're trying to dig up some of this data still. Obviously, a lot of this was done before Bill and I started. So, you know, getting information and finding where it was kept in the offices has been a little bit challenging, but we'll continue to update it. Um, the one other thing I want to say about that steamer, too, is that this was actually supposed to be replaced last year, right? And then the walk-in had the issue. So the school lunch program ended up paying 10000 to have that walk-in, I believe, replaced, right, Ben, not repaired. Right. Um, and so school lunch would have paid for part of this, but we just don't have the capacity, especially with that other issue that came up last year. Yeah, I, I was going to say that I, I love the fact that it shows the across the years. Um, and it, I hope that we're also, and this is more a decade thing, because I know we're going into some austere years co going forward. But uh, I think it'll help the town to if we can see over time the size of the backlog and and how that you know is that growing is that shrinking because that also speaks to how much money is needed for capital yeah you know on the other hand though this is the last year fy 21 is the last year we're paying off the library building and the paying off the public safety building so that uh you know it uh i mean i i still think that we ought to be thinking about you know really presenting a multi-year plan with some fairly big numbers on it to say, hey, you know, this has got to be done. And let's take it seriously rather than just sort of each year, well, okay, you know, try and nibble at it. I mean, sort of the way you did at Frontier. And I, it, it's, it's probably a bunch of work, but I think that way you might actually, you know, get get more done in, 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 in the next few years. Just tossing it out. I know you got nothing to do, Darius, so. No, it makes sense. No, it's good to strategize that way. It's, 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 that's good information. Um, and they know, I mean, and I'll press upon them as well when I say they're the capital committee and the select board, they know the building has certain needs. There's certain aging things. There's issues that have to be addressed. So um, that's good to see that the town may have some freed up some freed up revenue uh, where they're not spending or, um, on those loans. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't free you up. You still have to go through a process of, of getting the money appropriated and so on because those are funded with debt exclusions and so that taxing ability also disappears but what it means is that money it's at least dropping off the tax for people so that if you then come back and say well okay now we really got to come for the school you're you're not like adding it on to already existing stuff so i think it's an opportunity to to think a little bit bigger You'll also see in this workbook that there's several items they're down in around line 30 that are labeled deferred maintenance. And that's just to get on our radar for budget planning purposes. These are items that um, Bill Hildreth, the facilities director, feels consistently are not able to be paid out of the general fund, even though they should be because they're not really capital projects. But things come up and we end up where, okay, well, we'll put it off, we'll put it off, we'll put it off. And, you know, there's just some things that we need to start thinking about planning for annually, um, the carpet cleaning, miscellaneous painting, things like that, that, you know, don't add up to a ton in an individual um, repair, but, you know, we need to do them annually. So we might need to think about increasing the budget line to start adding in some of these maintenance pieces, which I know is difficult to do, but a good chunk of Sunderland's building maintenance budget goes towards that energy management system. And so that doesn't give us wiggle room to manage some of these other things that really need to be taken care of on an annual basis. And to, just to speak to that, Shelly, we did that um, in a similar fashion with our technology line item, where many of our 
many of those funds were going towards renewed subscriptions and licenses each year. So having that from on the maintenance side of things would be really helpful moving forward. Okay, I'll have to connect all about that. Yeah, so that's, that's it there, Greg. So we'll bring it to the December right. meeting. Outstanding. All right, uh, let's see, reports. Um, I'll just say this as fast as I can. I was, went to my first MASA thing. I realized I messed up. I should have like had all the things that were voted on put in front of you guys first and discuss those prior to attending. But uh, I, I've been there once, and now I kind of know what the thing is. Uh, it was wonderful that it was remote for me because it was, it was just an afternoon. But uh, uh, next time around, I'll, I would share that in advance. Uh, the, the one thing that, well, yeah, there was uh, a push to push back the, the MCAS testing uh, as well as to uh, lower the voting age in Massachusetts. And obviously, it's not a, a legislative body. We just make recommendations. But uh, it, it was a, a good event. Next time, we'll, we'll have more discussion within our group before sending a delegate. Um, let's see. Principal, Ben, you want to do your report? Sure. Um, Veterans Day Observance Ceremony last Thursday, November 12th, marked our 12th consecutive year we've held an observance ceremony for our students, staff, and our local veterans. Our guest speaker this year was First Lieutenant Christopher Parsons, who's a former Sunderland Elementary School student and is currently stationed at Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico. Uh, additionally, we were blessed to have Airman Maxwell Zadwarney join us for the ceremony. Airman Zadwarney, who happens to be stationed at Cannon Air Force Base as well, um, is the son of our third grade classroom teacher, Lisa Zadwarney. Um, during the presentation, we also gave a uh, shout out to others who are directly um, related to our school community um, that have served in the military, including um, our second grade teacher, Lee Worthley, um, her son, Joseph, and school committee member, uh, Peter Gagarin, who served uh, a couple years ago. Um, and thank you, Peter. <laughs> And Peter joined us for the, the ceremony as well. Um, so it was great to see him um, on there. Uh, walk and roll success on October 22nd and 23rd. Uh, we held walk and roll events for our A and B cohorts. Uh, this is always one of our favorite and biggest events of the year at Sunderland Elementary School. Um, Mr. Ha Mr. Matthew Howell, our English learner teacher, is the driving force behind making this happen. Um, and special thank you to our faculty volunteers and sixth grade student ambassadors who helped out as well. We have a PTO meeting uh, tomorrow night and then on December 2nd and 16th, those are the dates for family teacher conferences. And that's the report. Uh, Questions? Thank you. All right. Uh... Superintendent report? I have nothing at this time. Outstanding. All right. Uh, motion to adjourn? I'll move that. Outstanding. Yeah. Second? All right. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Keith? Yes. Uh, Peter? Peter? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yes. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Greg, yes. Thank you all very much.